We covered many different anime distributors here on Anime Abandoned, from the fairly well-known manga entertainment to the historically significant Harmony Gold. Today, though, we're going to be looking at one of the properties of a fairly obscure anime distributor that, despite the odds, still exists today. Urban Vision. Well, technically, they exist in some legal definition, but their properties have fallen by the wayside and into bargain bins you can find in dealer rooms the world over. Though Urban Vision never had any powerhouse licenses that could compete with the likes of Funimation or even ADV, they did distribute some fondly remembered old school series like Golgo 13 and Vampire Hunter D. However, most of their library consists of your prototypical ultra violent series that stained the reputation of anime through much of the 90s. Which is certainly true for Wicked City here, directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri, the same man who gave us this. <laughs> and this. We're in good hands. I'm convinced that the stereotype of anime being ultra-violent tentacle porn was started solely by Wicked City. Despite it not being a porn, there's enough blood and tits to make anyone think otherwise. In a rather funny twist of fate, Todd McFarlane went on record that Wicked City helped him create Spawn. So much so, in fact, that Kawajiri was hired out to be the lead title director on the Spawn HBO cartoon. Damn it. Let me guess. The first day on the pro bono case. Is it that obvious? <laughs> it's the only time you get frazzled. He probably doesn't put that on his resume. We begin our tale with yet another opening bit of narration that is eerily reminiscent of the opening to Angel Cop. We live in an era when our cities are armed with steel and concrete. Computers and electronics barricade our minds. It doesn't change the fact that there exist a lot of strange phenomena, bizarre beyond reason or logic. By attacking Japan's political and financial institutions, a terrorist organization could quite realistically hope to destabilize the world economy. I guess there's only so many ways of spoon feeding the audience necessary but awkward exposition over images of a city's skyline before you wind up repeating yourself. Our hero, Rock Lee, gets invited up to have sex with this not at all evil woman. Seriously, if her eyes were any more malevolently slanted, she could be blindfolded with a strand of dental floss. He's a healthy one. Let me see if I can wake him. <gasps> My god, has this wild woman been hiding under that demure exterior all this time? Hmm. Ain't it the truth, it's always the quiet ones who are secretly cock-hungry spider demons with toothed vaginas. I'm afraid you woke up to the truth a little too late. I have no more use for you, lover boy. Fun time. Well, it was nice knowing you, Erection, but I won't be seeing you for quite some time. That was a close one, wasn't it? But that's all right. I have what I came for anyway. Really? God, you are one sick bastard, you know that? Spider-Bitch gets ghost after missing the chance to chow down on Rock Lee's kielbasa. If you're wondering what the point of this opening scene is, I think it's to establish the mood and tone for the rest of the story. Which, judging on the scene in question, is a mood and tone of- OH DEAR GOD NO! Had a somewhat odd experience with a date, I'm told. <clears throat> okay, what kind of romantic life do you have to lead in order for nearly having your junk bitten off be considered only... odd? It's revealed that Rockley is what's known as a blackguard tasked with keeping the boundaries of the human world and the demon world, called the Dark World, intact. Rock Lee is then given an assignment to protect a VIP who is important for an upcoming peace treaty between the two worlds. 
Of course, this is so important that it's explained to us via cheesy narration that is so important it's given its own dated soundtrack. Black Guard. That's my real work. Not much job security, and a whole lot of risk. <sighs> oh, I almost forgot. You're going to work with a partner this time. Well, that's about time. I thought you guys forgot I was done. I was getting hungry. <laughs> I wish. Anime Eddie Murphy would have been 12 kinds of awesome. Alas, no, Rock Lee doesn't get Axel Foley, and instead has to settle for a blackguard from the demon world, who's about one hair cut away from being Annie Lennox from the Sweet Dreams video. She arrives in the nick of time to help Rock Lee fight John Carpenter's The Thing. Can't say you haven't got an opinion. My name is Taki uh, Renzaburo, 28 years old, height 6 feet 1 and a half inches, weight 176, blood type AB, official cover electrical equipment salesman. Salary 2400 a month. Uncircumcised, birthmark on the left butt cheek, and joint owner of the Buca de Beppo off Highway 60 in Wycliffe, Kentucky. It doesn't take long for Annie Lennox and Rock Lee to meet the prime they're supposed to protect. Well, when they told me that a woman from the other side would meet me at the gate, I certainly wasn't expecting this beautiful a specimen. <laughs> 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 Why you bitch, I'm gonna break your- Now, now, don't be rude. I'm rude, why? I'm just following common etiquette, you moron! Th th this guy, I just... Common etiquette? Common for who, Charlie Sheen? If I can borrow the phrase, this guy is unfucking believable He's a withered little shit who cannot keep it in his pants. He's almost always talking about fucking in one way or another, to the point where he literally ducks his two bodyguards that are protecting him from the very real threat of demons to fuck some soapland prostitute. Why did you turn over on your back? My, mm, well, if I must. <gasps> what? My, that's impressive, Grandpa. I've never seen one like it. <laughs> well, I have to keep up with the young bucks, don't I? <laughs> Dude! What are you doing? The guy literally looks like the Crypt Keeper fucked a pile of beef jerky. Have you no decency, sir? I know that I'm skipping around, but up until the point where the jerky midget comes into the story, the movie was just your run-of-the-mill kind of schlock. But with him around, Wicked City has been fucked to a whole new level. In any case, the next few scenes are sort of irrelevant as demons manage to attack the three at their safe house, and Annie Lennox is molested by the attacking demon before Rock Lee punches a new hole into the guy with a gun that's so powerful that the recoil routinely knocks him back into whatever structure is behind him and leaves a dent. This is when the jerky midget makes off for that soap land I mentioned earlier, and surprise, surprise, the prostitute he hires is another demon. Why am I not showing you the footage? Do you really want to see naked jerky midgets some more? I didn't think so. The Soapland Whore leaves Jerky Midget low on life, so they hightail it out of the city and to a special hospital where he can be treated. But it seems that the whore has left a nasty surprise for them inside Jerky Midget. What the hell's wrong? I swear to God, if the dickhead tentacle grub from Doom Megalopolis comes out of him, I am going to strangle a puppy. Well, patches better count as lucky stars, because what comes out of him is actually a demonic parasite that latches onto Annie Lennox and fills in Wicked City's tentacle rape quota. Luckily, Annie is able to summon a bolt of lightning that breaks the surrounding trap that the three are in so that Rock Lee can escape with Jerky Midget and fry the tentacle demon. By... giving herself a breast exam. I've neglected to mention so far the budding relationship between Rock Lee and Annie Lennox, since it's kind of hard to focus on the forced love story when you're being assaulted with shrieking nightmare fuel every ten minutes. Still, it's important to note this because of the movie's bullshit ending, but we'll get to that in good time. Oh, and Jerky Midget is wearing the Triforce on his tracksuit. I don't have a joke for it, but I know that if I hadn't brought it up, someone would most likely call me out for it. Makie is gone. She used all her energy to destroy the black space that had trapped us. 
When the space vanished, I guess she was obliterated along with that thing. I don't know. It's like the voice actor listened to Harrison Ford's narration in Blade Runner and thought, <laughs> I could be twice as stilted and boring as this hack. After placing Jerky Midget in Luke Skywalker's healing tank, the renegade demons who have been attacking them this entire time send a message that they have Annie Lennox in their... well, rapey clutches, and dare Rockley to come and save her. Immediately growing compassion for this woman he met literally 12 hours ago, he agrees, despite Jerky Midget telling him that his goal is to protect his wrinkly ass. Look, sir, nobody's getting through these barriers, so he'll be perfectly safe. You mean your love for her would make you abandon me? She's a black world woman, or have you forgotten? For God's sake, we're humans after all. We can't be wasting our precious time packing after some bimbo from the other side. She gave her life to save you and me, and that's something I can never forget. She was supposed to give up her life, but I'm irreplaceable, goddammit. Without me in the ceremony, it's impossible to come up with a peace agreement, you pea brain. Don't you mix me up with that, that bimbo, you got it, mister? Jesus, it's like somebody dared the screenwriter to write the most absolute dickhole character ever. Not only is he a lecherous pig, but he's also a selfish asshole who only now realizes he has to be protected. Dude, where was this attitude of yours when you ducked your two bodyguards to fuck some demon bimbo that put you here in the first place, you complete dick? Rock Lee gives Jerky Midget the bird and sets off to rescue Annie Lennox. Kill him. punch a dude to the soul like that? I mean, I don't even care that the movie never explains why he's this strong. Why is he even bothering with the hand cannon at all? We have to see that again in slow-mo. <laughs> Steven Seagal only wishes he could make himself look this strong in his movies. Ooh! Gaze into the fist of Rock Lee, motherfucker! This jolt of badassery just comes out of nowhere. He even slowly loads his revolver and lets the big baddie just pimp up to him as if to say, yeah, I know I got murder standing not 20 feet away from me. Don't mean I gotta rush things. Although that probably was a dumb move on his part because if he hurried his ass up, maybe the big baddie wouldn't have the time to absorb the dead demons and turn Super Saiyan. You live and learn, I guess. Miraculously, though, some chain lightning poofs into being and interrupts the fight, freeing Annie Lennox and giving Rock Lee an opening. It's a good thing that God invented Deus Ex Machina, because Rock Lee would have been really in trouble. The two manage to gather themselves before making their way back to Jerky Midget, where they're balled out for leaving the little asshole behind. Taki, I'm very, very disappointed in you. And in spite of that, you're one of the best black guards I've ever seen, but you're too goddamn romantic. You understand what I'm saying? That alone is your one fatal flaw. Well, that and your refusal to change clothes. Honestly, how long have you had that tux on? All day? Christ, you smell like a dead raccoon! But it turns out that the big baddie isn't quite dead as he slowly regenerates. He tells Spider-Bitch from way back at the beginning of the film to finish the job they couldn't do. Listen to me. We failed. We underestimated their abilities. It's my fault I should have stopped from before when I had the opportunity. Actually, yeah, that is totally on you. Rockley was naked and totally defenseless. There was literally no better time to kill him. You suck. Spider Bitch manages to trap Rock Lee, Annie Lennox, and Jerky Midget, who followed them for a transparently convenient reason, in a tunnel. I'm gonna rip your body into pieces so small you won't be able to find them. <laughs> <laughs> You see, that's why 
why I shouldn't be a voice director. If there's a scene where a voice actor has to laugh maniacally and ceaselessly for an extended period of time, I wouldn't be able to stop myself from making the voice actor give me like 12 different takes. God, am I a dick. Luckily, again, the Deus Ex Machina lightning poofs into being and fries Spider Bitch in the vagina. Yeah, this is kind of a weird movie. We fade to black only to find Rock Lee and Annie Lennox naked in a church, where they proceed to fuck. Yeah, because if there's one thing that gets people in the mood to get down with the mitosis, it's waking up naked in a church with no idea how you got there. Actually, if I could be honest here, it's rather refreshing to see a sex scene that's consensual for a change. I mean, sure, it's between two people who've known each other for at most a day, and this is right after nearly being thrashed to death by Spider-Bitch, but baby steps. The two aren't able to bask in the afterglow for long as the big baddie once again makes his presence known. But that's when Jerky Midget shows up and clears away all of the confusion. Go where? What are you talking about? The peace conference. What do I have to do? Spell out all the details? But that's your job. No, you're supposed to sign it. Listen, I think you better... You no, know, kid, sometimes you're a little slow upstairs. Not to impugn your ability, but you have things all wrong. I was brought here to protect the both of you, not to have you protect my bony behind. <laughs> but wait! <laughs> it gets stupider. This thing goes back a lot further than you realize. A sort of spiritual sympathy has been developing slowly for a long time between the human world and the black world. <laughs> Unfortunately, incompatible genes make it a virtual impossibility to produce any offspring between us. And the Kappa researchers of both worlds have picked as having the best shot at making a baby, this time around at least, is you, Mackier, and your young Lothario there. That means you, Taki. The two of you are perfectly suited genetically to create babies that'll have both the ability and the responsibility of creating a new world. So, to wrap up, this entire plot was meant to get Rock Lee and Annie Lennox to fuck so that they could have a child which would lead the humans and the demons into peaceful coexistence, and this was not explained to them because... why? Seriously, why the fuck did no one tell these two that they were supposed to bump uglies? Were they shy about it? Did they get too embarrassed? Were they afraid that either one of them was gay? How much time would this movie have saved if they just told Rock Lee and Annie Lennox at the beginning of the film that they're supposed to boink like bunnies and queef out a baby? And actually, now that I'm on the subject, what is with the director putting these odd sex-related plot points in his films? I mean, from this to that odd turn in Ninja Scroll where Jubei has to fuck Kagero in order to cure him of poison, you just get the feeling that Kawajiri just wanted to make a porno. Dude, just make a fuck flick. It's not like there isn't an audience for it. <sighs> Well, trying to get this review back on track, it looks like Jerky Midget is the source of all those Deus Ex Machina bolts from earlier, and uses his powers to fry the baddie in one of the coolest villain deaths I've seen on this show since Queen Venom Snatch took a sword to the forehead. We got lightning bolts, a cross used to impale someone through the forehead, and an explosion that sends energy flying out to the sky. The only way this would have been even more awesome is if Tony Yaw just came out of nowhere and Chris and kicked the guy into orbit. That would have made me come rainbows. But the movie ruins it since the guy isn't dead, and we have to settle for the newly impregnated Annie Lennox slicing the guy in half. Lame. Oh yeah, it's also revealed that she's pregnant not mere minutes after boinking Rock Lee. Bullshit! I wanna like Wicked City, really, I do. It's got some great action scenes, the dub script and the voice acting are actually not half bad considering the time. But goddamn does it shit the bed during the third act. And believe me, I can handle stupidity. But not when it's this blatant or insulting. Good riddance. And speaking of stupidity, 
You ever wonder what Golden Boy would be like if you removed all the subtlety and restraint? <laughs> well, wonder no longer. Till next time!